Absolutely. So use the Slido thing. I love questions. I, got, I even left time at the end for it. Um, keeps me on my toes. So hello, world. How's everyone doing? How's everyone doing this morning? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they had coffee out there. Come on, people. Come on. No, it, it's a weird response to that question, isn't it? I mean, you don't really walk through the halls of your agency and you're like, hey, Jeremy, how you doing this morning? I'm like, woo! It's crazy, right? No, like I said, my name's Jeremy Carson. I'm a creative director at Saatchi and Saatchi in Los Angeles. And um, on the side, I do this. I do this. I, I talk to uh, creative professionals, just like you, about all of the interesting things that um, our future of our agencies and industry and everything is, is really headed for, and, and how it is that we're supposed to actually get there. And uh, I do that through articles that I write at jeremycarson.com, and I also uh, post a lot on LinkedIn. If any of you follow me on LinkedIn, I'm sorry. Uh, if you don't follow me, please follow me. I am desperate for the attention. Um, but one of the things that people mostly notice about me is I wear sandals. Yep, right here. Wear sandals. Every single day I wear sandals. I actually uh, warmed my wedding. Father-in-law, not a big fan of that decision. Uh, but I was a brand loyalist. Brand loyalist. Wore the same types of sandals for 15 years. 15 years. Uh, wore rainbow sandals, if you want. They're very durable. Really great sandals. Until about a few years ago, I went on vacation, went into this little surf shop, and I saw the owner kind of look me up and down, and he stopped at my feet, and I could tell he was thinking, this, this is a man of class and sophistication. I will show him my finest flip-flops. And he brought me over to the sandal section, and he said, dude, you gotta check these out. They're called Olukai. He said it like that, very, very cool, Olukai. He said, they're the official sandal of the Hawaiian Lifeguard Association. They're made of wetsuit material. They always stay dry. He said, they're so comfortable. It's like walking on a pile of bunnies. I was like, that does not sound comfortable at all. Later, dude. <laughs> and then I'm on Instagram a little bit later, and I'm scrolling through my feed when suddenly, there it is. The sandals I was just looking at, right there in my feed. And I think, Mark Zuckerberg, Congress told you to stop listening to my conversations. No, 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 of course. I, uh, I, was, I was researching them. I take my sandals very, very seriously. And so I had gone online. I checked out the Olakai websites. I wanted to make sure that they really were these official Hawaiian sandals and everything. I, I went to the Yelp page of the actual store, wanted to make sure they were legit. I'd even gone on Reddit and I'd asked for reviews and, and checked out Google reviews for what these Olakai sandals were like, see if it really was like walking on bunnies. And, and I realized that, okay, Marky Mark and the Zucky Bunch, he was going to use that information in order to retarget me with an ad on Instagram in order to make me buy the sandals. Which I did, I did, wearing them right now. Brand loyalist, turned to Olakai. And that's what performance marketing's all about, right? Who's in performance marketing? Raise your hands, performance marketers? Oh, come on, you're, don't be shy. Yeah, performance marketing, this is what we do. This is what we do. We use information we have about people in order to tailor an ad to them so that it feels personally relevant, right? That's what performance marketing is all about. Brand marketers, who works in brand marketing. Come on, that's like the only two categories. There's a thousand people here. Raise your hands. Yeah, there we go. Brand marketing. Yeah, we don't do this. We don't, we don't really do that. No, 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 we're, we're more about universal relevance instead of personal relevance, right? We wanna make sure that there's something that everybody can relate to. And it's mainly been a side effect of the media technology, to be completely honest. I mean, back in the 50s, we knew that when you're watching a TV show, everyone's gonna see that same commercial. Everyone's gonna hear the same radio spot, everyone's going to see the same print ad, everyone's gonna drive by that same billboard. So of course, we have to use these more universal themes like, like love and sex and babies and puppies and Kevin Hart, things that everybody agrees is awesome, in order to connect with as many people at one time as possible. But what if we didn't have to do that? What if we could use the tools of performance marketing and combine them with the creative storytelling of brand marketing in order to create something that was not only universally relevant but also personally relevant. That's what I'm here to talk about today. I know my 
title of my talk had a lot of like buzzwords and jargon, but basically this is what I wanna talk about. How do we evolve our creative process in order to make our work more personal and relevant to a modern audience? That's it. That's all we're gonna talk about. Because we live in this world where, where Hulu and Netflix, they, they tell us exactly what shows that we think we're gonna wanna watch, right? And, and Spotify puts out these fire daily mixes based on what we've listened to, where, where YouTube makes billions of dollars a year based upon keeping people on the platform using its video recommendation engine. Every single piece of content that we consume in this modern world is based on the idea of personalization except for our marketing. And it's leading to this evolution in our industry. The problem is not many people know how to get there. I mean, in-house departments, consultancies, ad agencies, we're all kind of struggling to figure out, well, how do we lead personalization in our work? Do we lean into creativity? I mean, that's worked for the past 75 years, right? Or do we lean into technology? I mean, that's kind of where the future is. Honestly, it's neither. It's both. It's allowing love and logic to live together, allowing the emotional to become intelligent, letting the heart meet the head. Yeah. But what, is, what does an ad that does that actually look like? Right? Well, there's, there's a few parts, three at least in my presentation. Uh, so let's start with the heart. Simon Sinek, he gave a TED talk about 15 years ago. You probably heard it's called Start With Why. He also called it the Golden Circle. And he said, the most beloved brands, they don't talk about what they do, they talk about why they do it. They don't talk about what they do, they talk about why. Why they do it. Apple was his great example. He said that uh, they don't say, hey, buy our computers, they're overpriced. No, no, they say, think different. We stand against the status quo. We stand for creativity and innovation. So as long as their products pay off on that brand promise, we'll buy a computer from them, right? We'll buy a smart home device, we'll buy a music player, we'll buy a phone, we'll buy a watch. I won't, I don't like watches, but anyway. We'll buy whatever they make because we've bought into their message about why they do it. Nike, Nike is the same thing, right? They, they say, we stand for an active lifestyle. We stand for action over inaction. So what do they say? Just, just do it. Again, weak, come on, I know this is the first talk, come on, bring it. Just do it, it's universal, it's beautiful, it's something we all relate to, right? Yeah, but there was this guy back in the 1960s, his name was Marshall McLuhan. Now Marshall was the media theorist. He coined the phrase, the medium is the message. The medium is the message in a book that he titled, The Medium is the Massage. 50 years later, there's still a typo and it pisses me off. But what he meant was, where you say something should affect how you say it. Where you say something should affect how you say it. And it was really easy to see back in the 60s, right? There's like four pieces of content, if you really think about it, right? There's, there's video, there's words, images, and sounds. In the 60s, each one of those had their own place to live. You knew that a TV spot couldn't go on the radio because it had to be sound, and a radio spot couldn't go in print because it had to be words and images, and, and a print ad it couldn't go on TV because it had to be videos. There were black and white lines, and you knew that you had to say your message in a slightly different way for each one of those places. But in the past several years, our attention has become fragmented. We've started to break our attention into a dozen different devices and hundreds of different platforms and these black and white lines, they became kind of blurry. And we started doing things like this. Who, who has ever heard someone say this or has worked for a brand that has done this? Uh, you know, our TV commercial is basically a video. Well, where do you put videos on the internet? Well, you put them on YouTube. Let's put our TV commercial on YouTube. And you know, you can also put videos on Facebook. Yeah. And you know, as long as it's under 60 seconds, we should put our TV spot on Instagram and let's take 10 seconds of it, chop it out and just put it on Snapchat. Who here has heard someone do that or has been part of a brand that does that? Yes, but now we know better. 
Now we know that an image that you put on, on LinkedIn, it doesn't always feel right for Instagram, even though they're both images. A video that you put on YouTube doesn't have the same feeling as something that you would put on Snapchat. And, and a radio spot that you'd make for SoundCloud, it doesn't have the same capabilities as what you could do on Spotify. We know that every platform has its own language, its own tone, its own feeling, its own grammar, as they say. And so therefore, we need to make content that's made specifically for those platforms in the way that people consume that content. Actually, the savviest brands, they've been doing it for a while now. It's called Contextual Creative. Contextual Creative. It's creative that's made specifically where the message, the why, is crafted for where it's going to be heard. The why is crafted for where puts those two worlds together. And it works. It really, really works. I mean, it's, the reason that it works is because instead of doing what, honestly, creatives love to do, which is, I'm gonna do something that's, that's so cool, people are gonna change what they do in order to watch this 27-minute commercial I've made. No, instead, it, it leans into the behavior that people already have on platforms. And it grabs their attention, and it changes their mindset. That's what advertising is all about, right? That's what marketing is, changing mindsets. But that's not what I'm really excited about. Now, what I'm most excited about is not only combining why and where, but it's about understanding who are the different people that we're speaking to. Who? Because when you know that, you're able to find the person among the people. At least that's what I say. And when you do that, it changes the where for every person, and it also changes the why for everyone. Let me explain. Uh, my cousin, she has five kids. Five kids. Four boys, and the youngest is a girl. She was really hoping for that girl. And uh, her brother and her sister, they each have two kids of their own. So, so all the kids, they were over my grandmother's house for her 97th birthday, 97 years old. And so they're all hanging out in the living room, and they're on their phones, of course, and they're, they're just playing around. And I realize they're on Instagram, but they're all kind of using it in slightly different ways. And, and some of them are, are liking the photos, and they're kind of scrolling on, and others are watching videos. And they have it on mute, though. So they're just kind of like watching what happens in their feed in the video. And then others are diving into the comments, they're reading what people have written, they're writing stuff on their own. Others are, are going straight into the stories. You know that part's like Snapchat? Yeah, the vertical videos, but they have their audio on. So even I could hear the stupid videos that they're watching. And then some of them are going straight into Instagram television. IGTV, I don't know you know about that. It's where you turn your phone sideways like a television, and, and you watch Instagram Live, and you watch all that other kind of content, it's long form content. Some are completely ignoring the content. They're sliding straight into the direct messages, sliding into the DMs, and they're, they're treating it as a messenger tool. They're all between the ages of 12 and 22. One generation, one generation. Now normally we would say one generation uses one platform in the same way. Obviously not the case and not just my family, look at anyone. Everyone uses every platform in a completely different way. You consume content based on the way that you like to do it. And so if I was trying to talk to one of them, I would need to craft my message in a very specific way for them. And if I'm trying to talk to all of them on that platform, I need to craft my message in a half a dozen different ways. But I wanna make sure that I change their mindset. I gotta get in their heads. But the most important part about that is understanding what it is I need to say. Understanding what is that why? And how does that change when I know who I'm talking to? Let's go talk about Nike one more time. Nike, just do it, universal, right? Something we all understand equally. Not really. I mean, they already talk to athletes, right? And they kind of break it down between men and women. And then they break it down to sports. There's basketball and football. There's soccer, something that I think some people call football. I don't really understand that. It doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, if you know that you're making a campaign that is focused on people who want to play soccer, you're going to say something different to the teenager that lives in San Diego and goes surfing on the weekends versus the 45-year-old man that lives in New York that watches MLS versus the 20-year-old woman that lives in the Midwest that 
plays and thinks she's gonna be the next Messi. They have a completely different relationship with what just do it means to them. And so you need to say something slightly different to them. But what we tend to do is just say the same thing to everybody. One broad message goes out to the world, universal. But if we just change little details about it, if we told a story that was able to adapt to what those personal relationships were, we wouldn't only be universal, but we would also be personal with what we're saying. We'd find the person among the people. Cool, so if I've done my job, you're gonna all go back to your CMOs this week and you're gonna say something like, hey, I saw this guy on a Wednesday, had amazing taste in footwear, but he said, we need to find the person among the people. Yeah, and she's gonna be like, he sounds like a genius, go do that thing. And you're gonna go and you're gonna try to do it, you're gonna try, and it's gonna be really hard. It's gonna be really, really hard because we're not really meant to do these things together. No matter if you're in-house or a consultancy or an ad agency, we kind of follow a, a process that's a lot more linear. And, and every group kind of has their own goals and their own, their own ideas of success and, and their own KPIs and their own targets. And then they do their work and then they hand it off to another group who has their own goals and their own ideas of success and their own targets. They hand it off to the next group and we kind of pass it along. I mean, think about it. Uh, who? Strategy, right? They figure out who is it that we need to talk to. You work with the client, if you're an agency or in-house brand manager or anything like that, and you figure out, well, who's, who's the golden child that we need to speak to? We call it the aspirational audience, aspirational audience. And they give it a name like Angela. Angela, without fail, is what? She is a millennial, yeah which means she's somewhere between the ages of 22 and 37 because a college student is exactly the same as someone that has a mortgage and two kids. But one thing that all millennials share is what they believe that experiences are more valuable than possessions. Yeah, it's good because she makes about $70,000 a year, but she has about $246,000 in student debt. Yes, every asshole in marketing is trying to speak to Angela, right? We have to, she's this huge part of the buying economy. But, but what happens is creative is creating something that's universal. And so they get Angela from strategy and, and they say, oh, okay, I gotta make it make sense for Angela. I have to figure out why this brand is relevant to Angela. Okay, and they kind of back into this through their creative. And they take this singular piece of creative and they hand it off to media who figures out where is this campaign running. And they've been creating this incredibly complex media plan that speaks to everyone. And they take this creative meant for Angela and they apply it to this campaign plan that's meant for everyone and they realize it works great for Angela on YouTube, but not so great for Jim on Twitter or Pam on Snapchat, or Michael, on Facebook, or Dwight, on Spotify, or Phyllis, or Stanley, on Instagram, and yes, these are all office characters, but my point is that they can't do anything about it. You can't, you can't. You make one piece of creative, you put it everywhere, you change it for one person, you change it for everyone. But did you know that actually um, these media companies, Facebook, and, and uh, Spotify, and Twitter, and Snapchat, and Google, all of them, they have in-house production departments whose sole purpose, the sole purpose, is to take the work given to them by brands and agencies, tear it apart, just rip it apart, and then Frankenstein it back together so it kind of fits the best practices of the platform. Now to me, as a creative, that sounds like you're tearing my child apart, and you're, you're taking its leg, and you're shoving it on its forehead, and its arm is on its back, and its mouth is its butt now, and, and I would much rather just craft something specifically specifically for the person and the place that they're going to see it. So it's successful. That's why they do it. They want it to be successful so that you spend ad money with them. But the problem is, well, I've had creatives come to me, not any that work with me, luckily, and say, Jeremy, I don't create things for success metrics. No. I create things to be cool. I was like, cool, Fonzie. 
Why not both? Right? Heart and head. The only way you can do that is when there's overlap. When you change the way that you operate. And in this modern world, with this kind of modern structure, you have to put something at the center. Something that's a north star for everyone to align on. And in the modern industry, that is a four-letter word to most creatives. What? Data. Yeah, you are wondering when I was going to say data, right? Yeah, most creatives, they hate data, which means they hate me because I love it. I love it. It lets me do this. It lets me know who I'm talking to, right? Because when you put data at the core of your process, it changes everything. It aligns everyone to one thing, one goal. For example, strategy. They don't look at an aspirational audience anymore. No, no, they look at everyone. They look at everybody who's engaged with the brand, who hasn't engaged with the brand, and they lay it all out and they use data to figure out, well, how do we break these big groups of people into much smaller, digestible audiences with clear distinctions between all of them, where they all have their own relationship with the brand, right? And they align it with the data. And then they take these audiences, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's six, sometimes 20 or 100 even, depends on what you need. And they hand it off to media, and they work with media in order to figure out where is the attention of each one of these audiences. And then media crafts their plan, their media plan around these audiences. Because it doesn't matter how many audiences you have if you can't target them, so just remember that part, right? And then, that way, when creative works with strategy, in order to understand why that brand is relevant, they are able to craft a message about why the brand's relevant to each and every audience, a unique message, unique one to each audience. And then they work with media in order to fine tune that message in a way that's crafted specifically, specifically for how that audience consumes content on that platform. And in the end, this is what you get. And if, if you've kind of passed out halfway through, because I know it's early, just pay attention the next five seconds. We need to create unique content for every audience on every platform. Create unique content for every audience on every platform. And you're going to realize that's a lot of work. It's a lot. You're going to go from making five to ten pieces of creative a year to making five to ten thousand pieces of creative a year. And you're going to have to alter the way that your agency operates. You're going to have to alter your creative process in order to get there. You're going to have to change the way that you produce the work. You're going to use things like dynamic creative, dynamic video. You're going to have to be much more lean and agile. But you're going to realize that it works. Again, because you're, you're capturing their attention. You're not trying to change it, and you're, you're trying to fix and change their mindset. You know, Hemingway, Hemingway said, great art allows people to find meaning in it. Now, we're not trying to create fine art with what we're doing. We are trying to tell stories, though, stories that are meant to connect with people. And so by using these modern tools, and that's all they are, they're just tools. Snapchat's a tool, data's a tool, television is a tool, radio's a tool. We don't only have to hope that people are going to find meaning in what we're saying, but we'll know what that meaning is because we'll have made it part of the stories that we're telling. We'll be able to look at our audience and say, we don't just want you to know who we are as a brand. We want you to understand that we recognize who you are, that we've taken the time to find you as a person among all these people. Thank you.